benefit agreements and project labor agreements that help keep labor local. We need to make sure workers are safe on the job. We need registered apprenticeships to support individuals who have historically faced barriers to these good paying jobs, especially women and people of color who should be able to access good clean energy and infrastructure jobs. And importantly, critically, fossil fuel workers who risk becoming dislocated or displaced need targeted support services and resources, which will be provided through a National Economic Transition Office. Also, as co-chair of the House Oceans Caucus and Congress Congressional Estuary Caucus, I am thrilled that the con uh, Climate Action Plan recognizes the power of our ocean to be part of the solution. The blue economy, our commercial fisheries, ports, tourism, outdoor recreation, contribute more than $7.5 trillion to the U.S. economy annually. We can support good paying jobs and protect the health of our ocean by investing in restoration of blue carbon ecosystems, by capturing the power of waves to generate clean energy, and by helping our ocean adapt to the effects of the climate crisis, effects like ocean acidification and harmful algal blooms. Our climate action plan will protect our planet, create good paying jobs, support a just transition, and build more resilient communities. I look forward to working with our colleagues on the Select Committee and all of our colleagues here in Congress to enact these policies and create a better future for generations to come. And now it's my honor to, uh, to welcome and introduce one of our uh, terrific colleagues, a uh, freshman from Colorado who has contributed greatly to the Select Committee and to Congress, Congressman Naguz from Colorado. Well, thank you so much, uh, Representative Bonamici, for that kind introduction. Uh, I first want to say thank you to Speaker Pelosi. All of this work does not happen by accident. It happens because the Speaker decided, as one of her first actions in the 116th Congress, to impanel the Select Committee on Climate Crisis. And of course, it was no surprise because she's been such a tremendous leader throughout her many years here in Washington on solving the climate crisis. And so we thank her for her incredible leadership and for pulling together this committee. I also must take a moment to say thank you to our wonderful chairwoman, our fearless leader, Chairwoman Kathy Castor. As a freshman member, I had not yet had an opportunity to interact with the chairwoman prior to joining this committee. And I am so very grateful that I've had that opportunity because she has been such a thoughtful and inclusive chairwoman, uh, dare I say, one of the best chairs of any committee in the 116th Congress. And so we're all very grateful for her as well. Um, let me say this very clearly. I, climate change is an existential threat. We know that we have a very short runway for action. And the IPCC report makes that very clear. It is getting shorter by the day. And there are far too many in this town, the president, the Senate, uh, who are standing by and watching as this crisis worsens by the day. Thankfully, that is not the case in the House of Representatives under Democratic control, because today we are acting by providing a roadmap that will truly solve this crisis. And in my view and in the view of my colleagues, that starts by trusting the scientists. If we don't listen to the science, if we don't put our politics aside to unite around this one global issue, the consequences will be catastrophic. As a result, it's critical that we make proper investments in science, that we equip federal labs across our country who are engaged in groundbreaking work with access to modernized facilities, proper resources, and that we safeguard scientific integrity at all costs. Colorado, my home state, is home to some of the most world-renowned federal research labs and climate scientists, 30 federally funded research labs and joint institutes across the state. And I was so grateful for the opportunity to welcome the chairwoman uh, and our colleagues on a bipartisan basis to Colorado for a field hearing last year. I'm grateful that the proposals I just mentioned are highlighted in the report, along with proposals to revitalize our nation's conservation corps, invest in regenerative agriculture, restore our forests and protect the beautiful public lands in Colorado and throughout our nation. I will also say this, Speaker, Assistant Speaker Ben Ray Lujan, future Senator Ben Ray Lujan said it very well. <laughs> in Colorado, as is the case in New Mexico, 
Climate change is not abstract. It is not distant. We have witnessed the impacts on our lands, our forests, our farms, and in our national parks. We see rising temperatures, earlier snowmelt, increased flooding and erosion, more frequent wildfires, and we have experienced a disproportionate level of damaging climate-related disasters. But in Colorado, we've chosen to meet that crisis, and this crisis rather, with action. Fifteen towns and cities across our state, including half of them in my congressional district, have adopted 100 percent renewable electricity goals. We are a leader in zero emission vehicles and clean energy jobs and, and home, again, to some of the nation's most renowned federal labs. It's time for Congress and our nation to follow this lead. And so I say to you all today uh, that our work truly begins now. Now is the time to rebuild, to recover with climate action at the core of our agenda, to initiate bold change, and to put the future of our children and the future of our planet at the center. The National Climate Action propo proposes a roadmap, and it's our job to make it a reality. Congress must swiftly act on these recommendations because there is simply no time to waste. And with that, I want to introduce my uh, distinguished colleague from the great state of California, whose years of leadership in framing climate change as a national security issue fundamentally has been so critically important. Julia Brown. Right, Julia. Uh, good morning, and I want to join the chorus of thanking Madam Speaker for her incredible vision and Chair Castor for her extraordinary leadership and for all of the activists here behind us today and across the country. It is you that has brought us here today. When anyone talks about addressing the climate crisis, you cannot do so without talking about the transportation sector. It generates more greenhouse gas emissions in our country than any other sector. Our report aggressively transforms our trans our transportation systems across the board. It not only pushes us to creatively rethink our approach to transportation in a way that will grow new businesses, boost our economy, and better position us as leaders in the global economy, but it does so with the understanding that smart transportation innovation means climate-focused transportation innovation. This report sets out policy recommendations we must pursue. And I am extremely proud as a member of both the Select Committee and the Transportation of Infrastructure Committee that we have already put so many of these policy recommendations which will be on the House floor this week in the Moving Forward Act. We know the urgency of acting now and the severe consequences of inaction. The scientists have said we must act, and we are unequivocally doing just that. The Moving Forward Act puts the United States on the path of achieving zero emissions by prioritizing carbon pollution reduction, investing in public transit, and building our fueling, our fueling infrastructure for zero emissions vehicles. From rail, to shipping, to aviation, to cars, trucks, buses, to the fuels that power them, to grid modernization, renewable energy, this is the most comprehensive look at the transportation sector with respect to the climate crisis in the history of Congress. As a nation, we must face this crisis boldly and smartly. Our action plan for a clean energy economy provides the roadmap to the future. It is bold and it is smart. The Moving Forward Act draws from that roadmap to invest boldly and smartly in our future and for generations to come and we are taking that action today. So with that, I'd like to, <laughs> I would now would like to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Congressman Jared Huffman, also from the great state of California. Well, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. We're here because Speaker Pelosi had the vision and the commitment 
to set this select committee in motion. We're here because Kathy Castor has been a fantastic chair and because my colleagues on the select committee have worked very hard with an incredible staff that Chair Castor pulled together. We're here because great advocates and scientists and experts have contributed to this work and the finished product of this select committee that I'm so proud to serve on is a 500 plus page action plan. That's a lot of pages. And the reason is this climate crisis touches every part of our lives, every part of our economy, and it challenges us to confront all of it. Half measures, empty promises, greenwashed fossil fuel schemes, those things are not going to cut it. And one of the things I'm most excited about, I love the entire action plan, but uh, I especially love the way that the plan calls for using natural systems as a key strategy for tackling the climate crisis. And I'll tell you why that's such a great thing in my part of the world, in Northern California. We've got a lot of farmers and ranchers who are ready to be part of the solution. While we're doing all these other things that my colleagues have talked about to slash emissions and stop producing the greenhouse gases that are overheating the planet, we've got farmers and ranchers ready to work on the other side of the equation to start drawing down carbon. And they need our help to do that. So this action plan calls for major investments by the federal government to scale up their good work and start drawing down carbon in ways that are cost effective, that make all kinds of sense, that provide co-benefits. Now, uh, we're also working on, on other aspects of how natural systems can help confront this crisis. They can buffer rising sea levels and extreme weather. Uh, they can help us through blue carbon. Suzanne Bonamici has been a, a leader in this respect, and, and it's the ultimate twofer. Some of these natural systems can draw down carbon while providing greater resilience for coastal communities. Many of these natural systems can help us be more resilient to fires and to droughts that we know are going to be more frequent and more extreme in the future. So uh, I'm so excited, Chair Castor, that you've included this in a comprehensive economy-wide action plan. Thanks to everyone who has brought us to this day, and now it is on all of us to take this great plan and put it into action. Now with that, it is my honor to uh, introduce another colleague on the select committee. Sean Caston of Illinois not only brings um, a lot of expertise and passion to climate change, he is a member of Congress who as a freshman hit the ground running with climate leadership as his very top priority. He's a great colleague and a great member of this committee. Sean Caston. Thank you so much, Jared. Um, but for climate change, I would not be here today. As many of you know, I spent 20 years in the clean energy industry before coming to Congress, 16 of them as the CEO of two different companies which, was involved, which were involved in the construction operation of 80, more than 80 different clean energy plants. There are no thermodynamic laws, there are no economic laws that prevent us from building a lot more of those. But there are a lot of United States laws that get in the way. And the good news is that those are the only one of those three laws that you can change. Um, I wanna thank Chair Castor and Speaker Pelosi for giving the climate crisis the attention it deserves and for inviting me to serve on this committee. Um, this report would not be possible without them. Carbon dioxide is a totally unique pollutant. It's the only one that costs you money to produce. You have to buy the fuel before you burn it. That means that reducing the amount of fuel it takes to provide us with our modern lifestyle will save us money and reduce pollution. Now there's of course a role for new technology as well, but we have a massive opportunity to deploy existing technologies and at least double the efficiency with which we turn a dollar of fuel into a lot of dollars of economic activity. Now, I don't say this out of some naivete. As much as I care about climate, most of my customers, most of my investors did not. They cared about earning a return on their investment. And if we in Congress apply that same economic self-interest to our energy and environmental policy, we will introduce massive growth and ensure a sustainable and clean future for our children. That's what this report does. It recognizes that our energy markets are not efficient. To the contrary, they're full of distortions that have caused businesses and households to misallocate capital for decades. Those distortions include things like the $650 billion a year we subsidize the fossil energy, 
They include things like the split incentive problem in the building space, cost plus utility regulation, and a consistent failure to consistently price externalities. This is our opportunity. Because in many cases, getting to a level playing field just requires removing the subsidies that are enjoyed by incumbent polluting participants. And when we level that playing field, the American consumer and the environment wins. Now in this report, we recommend establishing a national climate bank to remove the financial barriers to capital intensive energy projects. We recommend requiring publicly traded companies to disclose their climate related exposure so that reward seeking capital can better understand the risks they're taking on. Stripping oil and gas companies of market distorting tax breaks, putting a price on carbon. None of those policies individually are silver bullets, but together they represent a serious and more importantly necessary approach to reducing our emissions. I'm proud of this report. I want to thank all my colleagues on the committee. It has truly been a pleasure working with all of you. And I, I want to close with the wisdom of Winston Churchill. The era of procrastination, of half measures, of soothing and baffling expedience of delays is coming to its close. In its place, we are entering an era of consequences. We all know what we have to do. Let's get to work. It is now my pleasure to introduce fellow freshman, fellow clean energy business guy, fellow nerd, Mike Levin from California. Thank you very much, Sean. It's great to serve with a fellow clean energy and climate nerd as part of the 116th Congress. I actually want to thank all of our freshmen because not only in November 2018 did the voters elect scores of new freshmen deeply concerned about the future of this country, but also ready to act on this, the most important issue of our time, the climate crisis. I want to thank our magnificent speaker, Nancy Pelosi, a true climate champion who has led the way, who has created this committee, uh, and who saw fit uh, to name me to the committee. I'm forever grateful uh, for that. I'm also forever grateful to our amazing chair, Kathy Castor. No easy task to bring together people of all backgrounds, all ideologies on this issue, to try to come to some common ground. And this report, thanks to her work and thanks to the work of our incredible staff back there, what an amazing job you've done compiling all of these amazing efforts from all backgrounds, all different parts of our caucus. Very, very proud of this work. This work will serve our country well in future years when we have someone who's just as committed to these issues at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, who will take the actions that we need, who will work with the Congress, not against the Congress, who will work with the scientists, not against the scientists. That's going to come soon enough. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Long before I pursued public office, I was a clean energy advocate. And I knew then, just as I know now, that the solutions to the climate crisis are also solutions to the economic challenges that we face. And those are even more pronounced today than when I came to Congress because of the obvious circumstances that our country faces. In my home state of California, we've embraced ambitious measures to combat the climate crisis, and we've seen strong economic growth at the same time. In fact, I would argue those two things are directly complementary to one another. Last year, California supported more than half a million clean energy jobs in areas such as energy efficiency, renewable energy, and clean transportation. And through 2019, job growth in the clean energy industry was 10% annually. Clean energy technology, clean domestic manufacturing, and environmental restoration is already putting Americans to work. And this report highlights a number of ways that we can combat the climate crisis and create the jobs we need at the same time. Let's meet this moment. Let's create those jobs. For example, we can apply jobs, absolutely. For example, the report includes bipartisan legislation I introduced to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels by promoting environmentally responsible development of renewable energy on public lands. We can expand those technologies and grow our economy by extending important tax credits like the solar investment tax credit, which drive job creation, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and help level the playing field for clean energy. We'll also create jobs with strong federal funding for infrastructure, investments in new and retooled domestic manufacturing facilities, 
new buy clean procurement rules, expanded loan opportunities for decarbonization technologies, and the creation of a civilian conservation corps and a climate resilience service corps. <laughs> Alternatively, if we fail to act, if we don't meet this moment, we will allow other countries to take the lead. We will be purchasing technologies that are produced in China and India and Asia instead of in the United States of America. And I don't want that to happen. You don't want that to happen, right? No, no we can do it here. Now, some might take issue with the perceived cost of climate action, but I would ask them to also consider the cost of inaction. A good friend of mine, Marshall Burke, who's a re researcher at Stanford University, has estimated that inaction, taking no action, allowing the status quo, allowing the fossil fuel industry to dominate the landscape, will cost this country 25 to $35 trillion with a T if we do nothing. That's why we must act. I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old at home. And like any parent, there's a lot that my wife and I worry about when it comes to their future. But there is nothing that concerns us more than the planet we are going to leave behind for them and for their children. The path we're on right now, this continued inaction leads to a grim future for our planet. Our report charts a new, hopeful course for America. Now it's time to act. And these activists behind here, they're ready to act. Are you ready to act? Yeah. All right, let's get to work. Thank you very much. And it's my great honor to reintroduce our fantastic chair, Kathy Castor. Well, thank you to all of my colleagues. America, we are your representatives. We reflect your hopes and visions. And what we've heard through our broad-based outreach, is you see the future in a 100% clean energy economy with good paying jobs. You see the future in, in fixing the mistakes of the past where toxic pollution has been focused on communities that, that can't handle it anymore. So our vision is for the clean energy economy moving forward in a way that rebuilds America better and stronger more capable of handling the impacts of the climate crisis. Go to the at climate crisis, review our plan, help us push policymakers to enact these into law. Senate, I'm looking at you. <laughs> we need you now more than ever. Thanks, everybody.